welcome to the University System of New Hampshire Roundtable Series. I'm Clark Dumont. The University System of New Hampshire is the largest provider of post-secondary education in the Granite State, with approximately 32,000 enrolled students annually and more than 90,000 alumni living in the state. System institutions include the University of New Hampshire, Plymouth State University, Keene State College, Granite State College, University of New Hampshire, Manchester, and UNH Franklin Pierce School of Law. Today, I'm pleased to introduce our panel. Dr. Melinda Treadwell, president of Keene State College, welcome. Thank you, it's great to be with you, Clark. Thank you, good to be with you. Dr. Donald Burks, president of Plymouth State University. Thanks, Clark, great to be here. Good to be with you too. And Dr. Jim Dean, president of the University of New Hampshire. Hi, Clark. Thanks very much. Happy to be here. It's great to have you all here today. It's uh, indeed an honor and, and a distinction. Thank you for all joining us. Uh, I thought we'd take a moment for each of you to give us a one minute overview of your respective institutions. And if that's okay, then uh, let's start with President Treadwell. Melinda? Hey, thanks, Clark. And um, well, Keene State is the state's public liberal arts college. And so what that means uh, here is that we believe in a close, high impact educational experience for our students. Uh, we hold our history, we commit ourselves to preparing the future leaders and critical thinkers. And so we prepare teachers, scientists, artists, producers, performers, musicians. We also produce uh, some interesting degrees like safety professionals, um, nurses, therapists, legal scholars and historians, just to name a few. Uh, our students join a community at Keene. We share a main street with the city of Keene, which we'll talk more about today. Uh, it's a beautiful community, an incredible place to learn and an incre incredible place to work. And I'm thrilled to be here with my colleagues uh, as we help support the state and its public educational needs. Wonderful. Don. Thanks, Clark. Each of our institutions, and that's a great thing about New Hampshire, are located in a really interesting part of the state. And PSU has the opportunity to be at the gateway to the White Mountains, but also at the Northern part of the lakes region. So a lot of activities for the outdoors. Uh, we have skiing, hiking, we have a, a facility for uh, ice hockey. We've got kayaking, boarding, uh, and we have a great uh, outdoor adventure program which takes advantage of that and students participate from all different majors. Now we have 45 majors and at the undergraduate level and about 20 at the graduate level, but we'll really try to organize into seven clusters. And those clusters focus on everything from innovation and entrepreneurship to exploration and discovery. And all our majors are organized within those clusters. And when you first get here, you'll take a class in a, solving a wicked problem goal really is to take on something that is tough to solve, that you have to work across disciplines, that you have to work with each other, and you have to employ the skill sets that you develop in working in teams. And then you build on that throughout your uh, career here. One of the most interesting majors we have is an interdisciplinary studies major where you can construct your own major out of anything that you want. And we just added a climate studies major. So real breadth of background, I think it's exciting to have both the outdoor activities that you can participate in and also the in-class activities. Small classes, dedicated faculty, a very friendly, uh, close environment situated right at the base of the mountains. Thank you, Don. And Jim Dean. Clark, well, as Don said, and Linda said as well, I think the different institutions complement each other very well. Uh, UNH is a research institution. We generate over $100 million a year in research grants uh, from the federal government primarily, but from other sources as well, something we're really proud of. And we're what's known as a research one institution, which puts us in the group of the highest, most uh, effective and active research universities in the country. Uh, so we offer all levels of degrees from undergraduate degrees through master's degrees through PhD degrees and even do postdoctoral training. We have three campuses, one here in Durham, which is our biggest uh, campus, but we also have a campus in Manchester, UNH Manchester. And then as you mentioned before, our law school, UNH uh, Franklin Pierce 
law school is in Concord. So we have three different locations. Uh, of course, we have research sites uh, around the country, around the world, and even in space because of the nature of the research that we do. Uh, we're one of the top universities in the country in terms of sustainability. This has been a tradition that's been going on for, for many years and have consistently been ranked literally among the top five, sometimes the top two or three. We have really strong programs in marine science. So for example, one of our research sites is on an island in the ocean just outside the Bay of Maine. And uh, we do a lot of research in uh, oceanography and marine science and so on there. Uh, we have a very strong program in astronomy. Uh, UNH has had technology on virtually every space mission for the last 10 or 20 years. So there's all kinds of our technology uh, in space. And soon there'll be uh, a new addition to that, which was an experiment that was designed by students at our Manchester campus. So we're very proud of that. Uh, also a large and growing nursing program. Nursing has really taken off as a field now and we're very proud of that program. And we've doubled the size of it in the last year or so. While we're a comprehensive university, we're a medium size. We're, we're not nearly as big as some of the big, big state universities that many of you would be familiar with. And when I ask our students what typifies the university, they say that it's a feeling of community, that we're not so big that you can't feel part of it. And at least in Don implied this as well, uh, we're located in the seacoast part of New Hampshire. And so we're in an incredibly picturesque part of the state as are Don and Belinda's institutions as well. So we're really blessed with, with natural beauty surrounding our campuses. I would agree. I, I think the diversity is underscored by the unity that comes together by putting the all of the pieces together. Uh, thank you for, for your eloquence and for your insights. Well, for the first question, um, it's been nearly a year and a half, hard to believe, maybe not, uh, that we've been in life under the pandemic. And colleges and universities, among other areas of our life, have had to navigate through changing protocols and had to adapt literally on the fly in many, many ways. Let's look back, if we could, at some of the challenges and successes over the past 18 months at your respective institutions. And later, we'll look at to the fall when you all will be welcoming students back to campus. So our first question is, what did you learn about your on-campus community during the pandemic? Melinda, can we go to you? Sure, thanks. <laughs> um, I think as, as I opened and as my colleagues have said, it's the community on each of our respective campuses that really matter. And I think the biggest thing that I took away uh, as I thought about uh, today's conversation is that our commitment to community really mattered. We planned together, and when I say community, it's not only our college community, but it's the university system community and it's our city, uh, the city of Keene. Um, so we planned together, uh, we responded together, and we all thrive together. And I think those are things that um, at the outset of this, it was very uncertain. There was a lot of fear, a lot of uh, lack of clarity about what might come. Uh, and I'm really proud that our students really were rock stars. I, I don't know what else to say. Our students in early planning meetings where the students worked with us as a college community, every student I spoke to said that they are committed not only to one another and keeping each other safe, but they wanted to keep the faculty and the staff of this college safe. And they did not want to bring risk to the city of Keene or illness. And that is a testament, I think, uh, something I really learned about the sense of commitment to one another and the sense of commitment to the community. And I think it made a tremendous difference at Keene State um, this past year and the safety that we were able to, um, to share by the end of the year looking back. So I think it's just our ability to do everything together, uh, roll up our sleeves and get it done. And I'm really proud. Thank you, Melinda. Thanks. Jim, Don? Well, let's see, I'll go first just to change the order a little bit. How about that? So I would probably start with the same place that Melinda did, which is the, the grit and the caring that the community showed. And it's been a tough time. I mean, really, you know, for especially undergraduate students, this is their, you know, their only chance at an undergraduate degree. And, you know, they were sent home, then they came back, and then the rules changed as, as the COVID, as COVID developed. And, and they were really tough through all of it. I think uh, our faculty did a great job responding to it. We've heard a lot of really good feedback at all the institutions about how gracious and caring and concerned the faculty were. And the students were really resilient. They, they really hung in there in very difficult circumstances. Uh, one of the things I'm really proud of, and I believe we all did this, is that we set up an emergency fund for students during the pandemic. And uh, the biggest contributors to it were really faculty. So if a student had an emergency because a parent was laid off or their medical emergency, uh, there were funds that they could access. And 
it really did make a difference in the lives of the students. And I was just really proud of our faculty for championing that. Uh, the other thing I think we learned is how important the leadership team is during a crisis. And I was really proud of how our team responded. It's, it's too late to try and do some kind of organizational development and build a team at that point. So you're, as Donald Rumsfeld said, you go to war with the team that you have more or less. And we had a wonderful team and uh, people did a great job. And, you know, Don and Melinda, I'm sure can see the same things. In the early days of COVID, we were meeting seven days a week and sometimes more than once a day. And so any strains on a team are really gonna show up pretty quickly in, in that environment. But people really collaborated, they listened to each other. They always did the best thing from the standpoint of what's the best thing for the community and the university and the university system. So I'm just really, really proud of how our team responded. And then maybe the last thing I'd say is that we found that even a relatively big university can respond really quickly. So we created laboratories to do our own testing. Uh, we started with one, we now have three. Uh, we're doing thousands and thousands of tests a day, not so much now, but in the, in the height of the pandemic. And we're really just pleased and happy. And it was able, we were able to keep the campus safe because of the level of testing we did. So lots to be proud of there. Thank you, I Jim. Think, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Clark. I think the thing that struck me beyond what just uh, Melinda and Jim said, which I think were all high points of the uh, discussion that went on and, and the preparation for the uh, COVID uh, uh, reaction, uh, what we had to do, I thought that what all the campuses showed, and, and it was something that we're not often talked about or given credit for, is the tremendous adaptability of both the students and the faculty to the situation that was changing dynamically just about every day. And I think, you know, we had, everybody had challenges at one point along the way, but I think we learned a lot from each other. We worked together as a team, as, as we mentioned before, we had great support from the board in that all our classrooms became outfitted with uh, the ability to function in hybrid mode or online mode or uh, totally in person. So, and we bring that capability forward. So we not only learned how to be creative and adaptive in a setting that was really challenging almost every day and, we do, and doing that together in a team environment, but we also have built an environment that I think is stronger for the future ahead. Thank you, all of you for that. Uh, you, you talked about and you touched on the host communities and maybe Don, if I can keep you up, uh, um, how, let's, what did we learn about the host communities and how did you become partners in new ways? We, you know, it was interesting. I, somebody brought up this phrase while we were in the midst of this and they said, as a community, we've never felt closer before. And, and in a way it was really true because we had to function together in ways that supported each other. We both needed each other in very clear ways throughout this uh, pandemic. And I think it started right at the beginning. We had constant meetings between the uh, town board and ourselves working together to how to, to, to make things so that they were the best for the whole community. We worked together on passing you know, mask ordinances. Uh, we had a big Zoom meeting where people from all over tuned in and we talked with them and we, we went over our plan and, you know, it was really a good feedback in which we counted on each other through the whole process to do what we needed to have done. And it emerged to the end in a great success. And I think, I think as a community, it brought us closer together and we grew to know that we could handle almost anything. That's true. Jim, your observations and learnings. Yeah, my answer would actually be really similar to Don's. Right? It, it does feel like we grew together as a community. We had regular meetings between the UNH leadership team and the leadership team from, from Durham, where our, our largest campus is. Uh, we had lunches together for quite some period of time. Then when uh, conditions changed, we had Zoom meetings together for a while. We coordinated on expectations. So we had the same signs in the town of Durham that we did on campus. We instituted our mask mandate together. We took it off at the same time. I think we really strengthened that relationship. Uh, we also built new relationships with some of the landlords in town. And it's not like you know we were against them or they were against us, but we just hadn't communicated that much. So we brought them in because a lot of the challenges we had are with students living off campus. And uh, we formed a council and we had a number of calls with them. 
Um, and they were really helpful in trying to reinforce our public health campaign. So I feel really good about our relationship with, with the towns and not just Durham, but the other towns as well, uh, and the landlords as well. So uh, it, it was good already, and I think it got better, just as Don said. Thank you, Jim. And, and Melinda, you mentioned at the outset how Keene State is literally on the main street. So how about it, uh, Keene and Keene State? Yeah, I think uh, as uh, Jim and Don have both said, I think we, we have had a very strong relationship with the city of Keene, but it did get stronger through this. A couple of things I would add to what my colleagues have said is that I think as we went into this, the city with Keene State College, with our hospital, we really tried to reinforce and support one another. So if we had capacities, um, we stood up wastewater sampling and we did so with our city. And, and my colleagues could say the same, but I'm just trying to add additional breadth. So we stood up wastewater sampling that was used uh, with our city and for the college to look for early outbreak of any sort of COVID um, expansion that we were seeing. Our hospital worked with us to help support nursing and medical needs for the college. We stood up, all of us, and certainly here in Keene in the southwestern part of the state, we stood up an alternate care site. We stood up vaccination sites. Um, it was very responsive, as Dawn has said, uh, and it was very shared. It was a sense at the outset that the city, the college, and the hospital would help to hold the community um, and do whatever we needed to to help this community be safe and do everything we could to thrive and not have our economy and our city uh, suffer as a result of this pandemic. And I think we had that shared commitment and we're really successful. Um, the last thing I would share, it's similar to uh, Jim's point, we worked also with our landlords and much of our success in keeping our off-campus students safe was frankly, the fact that we shared our protocols with our landlords. We offered help and support for them in training. Um, we worked with the city, the hospital. We delivered joint Zooms for education and training, information about vaccines. We did a lot of those things that are part of our public mission, but we did it together and we did it nimbly as we moved around which questions, what did the city need? What did the college need? And it just was one of those moments where um, silos between us fell away. And we were all in this together to keep this region healthy uh, and to keep our, hopefully our community together. And, and I think it was that shared commitment that made a huge difference over here. That's wonderful. The synergy is terrific. And, and let's pick up on that theme of, of students. And the next question would be around students. And uh, as you think about how your students manage their college experience through the pandemic, are there examples that stand out to you either by particular students or student initiatives? Jim, can I go to you? Sure. So, I mean, as you suggested, really the immediate challenge for students was being able to continue to work on their courses and their degrees in very different circumstances than from what they, they'd imagined. Although we, like, like Plymouth and Keene, were open for the vast majority of this past year. The previous spring when COVID started, everything was remote and we had some remote classes throughout the last year. So students had to sort out, for example, how to do labs remotely and our faculty were very clever about figuring out how to do things uh, using Zoom and using kits that they sent home and so on. And then you think about, for example, performing arts. So we had students do multiple plays uh, that they produced over Zoom, uh, either live or, or through filming. Uh, and similarly, musical concerts. So we had many musical concerts that people got together to do. Uh, you know, I, I played one time with our band and gosh, they were all wearing masks that were adapted for the musical instruments. It was just really innovative the way that they came up with these things. I don't know if they have patents on any of them, but I hope, I hope that they do. Uh, and then also just students looking out for one another. So for example, we had uh, thousands of hours of additional volunteer hours from our students working with McGregor Memorial EMS, which provides ambulance and emergency care services. And we had an increase of 5,000 volunteer hours from the previous year. So while it would have been easy for students to just sort of focus in and shrink their focus of attention, they actually went the other way and tried to figure out how they could serve their fellow students and the broader community, really something to be very proud of. Thank you, Jim, for that. Don, how about a Plymouth State University? Yeah, I'm, I'll give you one good example. Uh, in, in line with what Jim was talking about is how the performing arts changed. And that was, we couldn't do really anything in the, um, in the setting we have. We got a great uh, silver theater that we do large uh, plays in. But what we could do was 
we could create sets in in videotape those sets so students made sets but the i think the most interesting and fun thing they did was they actually created like little mini tv series uh one of them was on a sort of a play off of star trek and so each week they had eight really episodes all through those weeks about what it was like so it, i think it drove them a lot into digital worlds. So I think that was really good. Um, I think the other thing that I, I think they did is they learned to get to know each other better in some ways because of the fact that, you know, we often have lots of large events on campus where students come together, spring fling is one of them, but there's all kinds of larger things where people get together in, in, as a group. But what I found was smaller groups getting together and really knowing each other and I think that if there was anything that we're going to try to emphasize as we go forward is sort of that positive aspect that students picked up and started themselves, which was really get to know those around you well and carry those friendships forward, as well as the larger activities. So I think they showed a great adaptability. Uh, I, think, I think it was tough. And I think if anybody says it wasn't tough on students, uh, they're just... They just don't know what those students went through. And I think as, as, as Jim and Melinda mentioned, we really felt for our students. I think the great thing was about how clever they came up with so many different ways to both improve their social life and to enact and do things that impact their future careers in ways that they learned and grew in. So some, you know, there weren't many positives you sometimes think when you get away from this, but there were a lot of things if you go in depth on it and look at it and you say, wow, you know, as a community, we really learned a lot and our students did and we did. And I think it's gonna make a more resilient culture and a more creative culture as we go forward into the future. Well said. Melinda? I would just add to what Jim and Don said. Um, I was really impressed with the curricular innovation that our students did to kind of create the same experience, but to do so in digital space. And I think that was really exciting. I think some things that specifically stood out for me from our students this past year was we had a lot of concern and our students had a lot of concern about their peers, their classmates and the sense of isolation, particularly the new students to our community. And so our students formed with faculty and staff, a wellness ambassadors program. We stood up some holistic health and mental well-being peer support groups. And we have almost 100 student-led clubs and organizations. And the students were very creative about forming social connection through those clubs and organizations. And I'm sure this is the same for the other campuses, but it's slightly different. And something that really stood out for me is the students, not only resilience, but their compassion for one another. And the fact that they recognized um, that this sense of isolation and, and um, separateness was something very unlike what they wanted or what they wanted for our incoming first year students. And so they worked really hard to create new and innovative ways um, to build community. And I, I was really impressed with how they, how they did that and the fact that they became part of our governance model, uh, pushing recommendations around these ambassador programs and investment in mental health and well-being. Um, and we supported those because they were so well thought out and really well developed. So uh, really proud of how the students created this resiliency. And, and I'm sure, as Don said, this will carry us forward and them forward in very strong ways, which I'm really excited to see where we go from here. That's terrific. And maybe if I can pick up on, on the theme with our next question, um, higher ed education leads us to awareness and continuous improvement. Um, and so what are some of the changes or innovations to processes or policies or otherwise um, that your institution made as a result of the pandemic that you plan to continue uh, permanently? And maybe Melinda, can we come back to you since you, uh, you chatted about innovation? Sure, so um, a couple of things. I think in our, uh, some major areas where we're going to continue to see change, I think what the pandemic did for us, we've been hearing around disruptive innovation, right? And changes to higher ed. I think what the pandemic taught us is that first and foremost, the students who choose any of our campuses want that residential experience. They want to be part of a community and they want to be in our labs, classrooms and performance venues. That came through very clearly. However, I think what the pandemic taught us as both Jim and Don have spoken to um, is the ability for us to neither live in an online or a place-based environment, to recognize that learning and creativity can happen anywhere and how do we uh, integrate that? So I think we're having a lot of discussions about how to think about 
learning happening in many different ways uh, in many different environments. And I think that's a major element of innovation and frankly, transformation for the university system that I'm excited to see where we will go as a result of the learnings through the pandemic. And I, I think the other thing I would, would share is that um, our clinical programs, one of the things that we have come to expect is that you need to be in the clinical environment to build the skills that you need. And so nursing comes to mind. Um, and there was a lot of concern about being in a virtual environment. And in fact, what we've learned is that our students with virtual simulation can actually gain deeper skill sets because they're not being told what they should be hearing and trying to listen for that. They're actually modeling what the sound of the, the spleen is, for instance, blood flow around the spleen. It's modeled for them in a virtual display. And that learning, our students believe, was far more profound in the virtual augmented labs. And then they could reinforce it in the three-dimensional clinics. Um, so I think we've changed, from my perspective, in a number of our clinical domains, we've changed perhaps ways for us to use technology to help build the initial skills and then reinforce it in the clinic rather than assume the clinic is the fastest and best way to build those skills. That's very different when we think about particularly healthcare and some other areas of clinical intervention. Um, so I think those are the two biggies that I would offer. That's terrific. Jim, can I come to you? Sure. Um... I think Melinda has really eloquently talked about the nature of education, and uh, I can't really add anything there. I think we've all learned uh, a lot about how teaching and learning go on, and we're really proud of what we've learned. Uh, on a little bit of a different front, we've certainly also found out that our employees can work in a variety of different ways. So we've had most of our, many of our employees uh, working from home during the pandemic, and uh, we've just announced recently that we're going to have uh, people come back to campus, but with a lot greater flexibility than we had in the past. So people will be able to work with their supervisors and their unit leaders and propose different ways of working. And you know, we're like, like uh, Keenan Plymouth, we're a residential campus. And so students expect to see people on campus and certainly anyone who's student facing will be here. And there's jobs that have to be done here, facilities, jobs, and so on. But a lot of people can work from home at least part of the time and like <laughs> really the rest of the country. And eventually the rest of the world, we're gonna be running those experiments and see uh, what is the most effective way for people to work. A lot of the studies have found out surprisingly that by eliminating, for example, the commute, people were able to get more work done than they did in the past. And so we're not going to go back to 2019 or 2020, we're going to go forward and see what we've learned from this in the same spirit as, as Melinda talked about. And then finally, I guess I'd say that we've offered an awful lot of outreach to the state of New Hampshire uh, over the last year, we've done webinars and, as I mentioned already, performances and lectures and so on. And uh, we're going to keep that up. And, and uh, it's interesting, uh, one of the many ironies associated with COVID, that uh, certain types of meetings, if you hold them online, your, your attendance is actually quite a bit greater than if you ask people to drive across the state to come to a meeting or, or to a performance. So I, I think that as much as we are, are happy about live meetings and live performances and so on, I, I think the future is probably hybrid. And we found that we can increase our audiences across the state by offering that as, a, as an opportunity. Well said, and it's not the here and now, it's the here and new uh, that we're in going forward. Don, uh, tell us about innovations. Yeah, just a few things. and and and. Uh, it's not really an innovation, but it's like the other side of what Melinda stated about the, the value and the ability to in, invoke simulations. The other side I think we learned is how many ways we can actually involve students in solving problems that are actually happening in the real world and how involved students are. Like we had wicked problems doing, working with the pandemic. We had nursing students that were out in the front lines, uh, given vaccinations, getting involved. They even got uh, basically their licenses early or at least a, an approval to be able to be out there and doing that. We have physical therapists that were involved in all kinds of activities. It, it was just, it was a, a way to really say, not only is there the simulation tool that's, that we're really getting, but we're also the innovation in opening up the campus to the world in such a way that the students are really heavily engaged in it. I think the other thing is it pushed us really a long way into the digital world, whether it's workers working remotely or it's students in hybrid environments in classrooms or online all the time. So 
I think it, you know, it did a lot of things where it pushed boundaries and, and where we were on the verge of something, it maybe pushed us over that. Uh, so I think it's really changing education. And I think a lot of those changes are really for the better. And I think it also changes the work environment as Jim was mentioning. So um, that's kind of the way I look at it. Well, I'm, I'm reminded um, that it's, it's not what we know, it's what we don't know. Uh, and it's not what we do in good times that define us. It's what we do in times that are challenging and adverse uh, that define us. And Most so definitely. I'm going to now move to the last question. I'm going to use that uh, a new pandemic term. Uh, we're going to pivot. Uh, and so looking ahead, uh, what is your vision and hope for the new school year, which is just a few short weeks away, uh, as you start to welcome students and faculty uh, back to uh, back to campus? Um, Melinda, may we start with you at Keene? Sure. Thanks. Um, well, I wish I could say that I, COVID's behind us, but it's not going to be. So I think I'll start there saying that we'll continue to have plans that are in place to ensure the safety of our students, our faculty, our staff, our community. Um, they'll be different. And so what I'm looking forward to in the fall and what I know our plans will be um, is that our students will be back with us. We're going to increasingly have more sense of normal on our campus. And I think that means that uh, performances and sporting events and clubs and activities will be much more of a normal um, cadence and a normal environment for students at Keene State. Uh, we're relaunching some traditions that we missed last year. We do a tradition where we clap in our students and launch the academic year with a, honor, a student convocation and we're going to merge the first and second year class this year. We're going to, and that's I think a really, I'm very excited for that because it's a really important opening tradition for your experience as a student at Keene. Um, we will still have some of our protocols in place. I think that's just part of what the next year will bring. But we've learned so much. And as we've spent these last uh, minutes talking about, we're ready for it. Um, and I know our students are ready to come back and be the rock stylish they were this past year. So looking forward to it and, and uh, expect good things. Thank you. Uh, Don, uh, let's talk about Plum State. I think we're, in everything we're doing and all our preparations, we're doing two things. One is we're preparing to celebrate an open environment where students can be engaged in all kinds of activities with each other. And we've dreamed up all kinds of things for them to do. But we're also celebrating that we're gonna be able to carry a lot of the things that we learned through the pandemic. A lot of the student engagement activities with each other, the gaming things, the alternative. We had a big thing on video uh, virtual bingo that the students just loved. We would have never guessed it. I mean, all kinds of different programming environments that cover both the digital world and the in-person world. So we're kind of excited to be able to be all together to see each other, just the the sense of community that builds when you can actually see people without a mask on their face. Um, we're prepared for the worst, the Delta variant, the Gamma variant. We don't know what's going to happen. But on the other side of it, we've been through that. We know how to deal with it. And it's going to be so great to see everybody in person and students all around. We've had a lot of orientation sessions the last couple of weeks, and it has just been fantastic. Everybody's commented how great this is uh, to be all together again, celebrating and really appreciate it. And I think we're going to appreciate that more than we ever did before. So we're excited. Thanks, Don. Jim, I suspect that you're looking forward to pent up enthusiasm and energy coming back to the campus in Durham. Yes, indeed. Just, just the same as my colleagues have, have talked about uh, having lots of things more open, being in person, uh, again, with lots of hybrid opportunities as well, but the opportunities to be in person with one another uh, we do a similar sort of welcome to campus ritual that we've been very happy to do over the last uh, couple of months for new students. And maybe if I'm just going to call out one thing, it would be that we'll be happy to have sports back. I mean, sports were really difficult, intercollegiate sports. We've all been down some dark roads with that over the last couple of years, but we're really hoping that our sports teams will all be back. I mean, uh, fall brings us football, men's and women's soccer. Shortly after that, men's and women's hockey and basketball skiing a little bit after that. So it really adds a sort of a livelihood, a liveliness to, camp, to campuses and uh, really a, a point for students to rally around. And we're really hoping that's gonna come back this year. Um, and I know I'm speaking for Melinda and Don when I say that all of this is made possible by students getting vaccinated and that that's really our, our plea 
for students is to make sure that they get those vaccines because that's going to be the difference between safety and health on campuses versus not having it. So we continue to implore students to please get those vaccines done. Well, I, I want to thank you. What I've, what I've heard is inspiring. Um, I've heard about resiliency. I've heard about innovation. I've heard about growth. I've heard about creativity. And I've heard about community. Uh, and I've heard about diversity of campuses, and I've heard about diversity of, of areas of study, but I've also heard about unity um, and uh, driving toward uh, excellence and, uh, and improvement and innovation. So uh, Dr. Dean and Dr. Burks, uh, Dr. Treadwell, um, Don and uh, Jim and Melinda, uh, I wanna thank you again for joining us uh, today and best wishes to you and to your colleagues and to your students and all of the staff uh, support you and help you to get what you get done and, and how you lead them uh, for a successful uh, year ahead. And thank you all for watching today, uh, this President's Roundtable. Uh, for more information on the University System of New Hampshire, please visit usnh.edu backslash yours.